All right. How about now? No, now it's fine. There we go. There we go. Sorry about that. It's okay. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Everything is good. It's raining outside, so it's fine. <laughs> is it really? Where are you? I'm in Portugal. Oh, wow. Great. Um, uh, we had a long summer, so now autumn has finally arrived. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 turning autumn here as well. So Yeah, that's good. And, uh, you know, let's talk about Theocracy. It's been seven years. That's a long time. <laughs> yeah, it really is. A lot longer than we expected. <laughs> So what was uh, this silence, so to say, due? I know you guys weren't really stopped doing anything, but it took some time to get some music out. Yeah, it's, it's true. There were there were a few things. So after the last album, Ghost Ship, I kind of I kind of hit a, a burnout wall um, where I needed a break. Um, the four albums that you know took so much out of me and the. The touring and the shows and then all the the side jobs and the recording other bands and all the the travel and all that so I, I just told the guys that i needed some time you know before we we did something else and then um so so we were already going to take a bit of a break and then you know and then COVID happened and then we had a, a band member change and then we had a record label change and then suddenly it's it's all these years later so so we knew it would be a little while, but we didn't plan on it being as as long as it ended up being. Yeah. When when you start, you know, the bulk of the writing for the for mosaic. Well, it it it, it went. It came over a period of time because there wasn't. Um, I, I was so. I needed such a break that I wasn't sure, you know, if, if there would even be another album. So there was no, no period where I really sat down and, and tried to write an album, um, you know, start to finish. It was more like, um, one song came eventually and then it's like, okay, there's, there's still something there. And then, and then another song came and another song came and, you know, finally it ended up, you know, where we had enough for it there was clearly going to be another album. And so, so it was really, um, it was really sort of over a few years, you know, you know, um, and, and really kind of individually, you know, the songs came just one at a time instead of all together. Yeah. But you needed that first one to be a bit motivated to, you know, to realize, okay, I'm still able to do something. Oh, that that's exactly right. And there's a song on the album called The Sixth Great Extinction, and that was the first one. And it was um I, I've mentioned this a couple other places, but it was when I, I wrote that, it was sort of right in that time where everyone was releasing surprise singles, standalone singles instead of albums. And so um we even talked about doing that. It's like, all right, we got a new song. Should we should we record it and put it out, you know, just as a surprise for the fans, you know, to say hey we're still alive you know um so there was a little bit of talk about that but then that ended up not happening and so so then you know once a couple more songs came it was like all right we this is clearly going to be something yeah do you, do you think the future might <clears throat> be singles there's a lot of talk about it you know i'm i'm old i'm not sure if i am ever going to adapt to a, a single format you know but if the future is like that, you know, so be it. But do you believe that might be the route for, you know, a lot of bands, artists to put out? Because I've seen like the Slipknot guys talking about probably not putting albums, you know, like an album anymore, it's just, you know, singles and stuff. I'm, I'm completely with you on that. I'm, I'm, I'll always be an album guy. Um, I, I don't know, you know, because it, it seems like people have been saying that that's going to happen for like 15 years now and people are still making albums. So, so I hope it doesn't. I mean, I think, I think there is something to the, the album format as, as a, as a work of art and as a presentation, I think there's, um, even, even the length, you know, somewhere around an hour or whatever feels there's something to that, I think. And, um, I mean, maybe it's just conditioning and because of what we're used to, but, but I don't know. I, I wouldn't be interested in, in just doing 
singles like that. I mean, <clears throat> you know, we we've done you know Christmas songs and and things like that, sort of standalone things but as far as an actual album i mean i spent so much time thinking about the the running order and the track listing and the way the way the the thing flows from start to finish you know and and i love that part of it i mean when i was a, a kid before i could even write songs you know long before i had a band or anything like that i would sit in school and make up fake albums and fake song titles and track listings you know because i love that part of it so so to me that's that's a part of it that's that's uh entwined in, in the whole thing so so i hope it doesn't change yeah you know but one of the things I, I realize like with time you know i go back to the early 80s when a band would put out an album sometimes they already be on tour before the album was out and you know obviously there would be no recordings of any kind <laughs> like we have today but you know i remember i made in being on tour and the album would only come out three or four weeks after Right. And nowadays, you know, a band almost needs a year to prepare an album release. I see a lot of bands putting like four, five, six singles almost before they show the whole record. Um, would you do you think that, you know, instead of singles, probably putting like almost half or more than that of an album out before the actual album is out. Do you think that would work? I, I don't like it. I know I know what you're talking about. I, I think it's in fact I was I was relieved that um there was a nice compromise, you know, with Atomic Fire with our album. You know, we did two two videos and singles, you know, a couple of months before the the album is out. And I, I think nowadays people's attention spans are so short that yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, I see these these bands that are are putting out singles for like six months before the album comes out and no one's going to even remember you know by the time the album comes out you know it it's uh you know people are on to the next thing so quickly these days and and nothing really has any staying power so so yeah i mean i'm i'm not a marketing guy i don't know what the best way to to do it is or whatever but but um I was thankful that in our case it was it was a little more reasonable as far as you know just having a couple of singles and 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 not being too far before the album comes out because because otherwise I don't know it just seems like these albums come and go with no you know no fanfare and no no attention these days it's just like it's forgotten about the next day yeah but yeah it it is it is interesting how it used to be and then you know I mean going back even further, you know, to the seventies, I mean, it was even crazier, you know, two albums a year, you know, yeah. queen, queen doing queen two and sheer heart attack in the same year. It's unbelievable to think about that stuff. You know, it's insane. You know, how a band would just, you know, like deep purple, whatever, they would go into the studio, record eight songs, whatever it was. And the album was out and they are classics. You know, obviously the musicianship is there. You need it to be good to you know i think the great learning curve for those artists was they only had like four tracks sometimes a tape to record and they don't have like hundreds of tracks <laughs> and plenty of chances to re-record you know now with pro tools you can you know cut everything to freaking pieces and which is great you know i i think we should embrace technology but the technology back then helped the bands be better musicians and be ready to go in the studio, nail a first or two takes, and that would be it. Now you have plenty of time to work on a song, and you might lose interest in it. <laughs> I, I agree. I mean, limitation, I think, is is really beneficial to to art sometimes like that. I mean, you know... Would, would the Beatles music have been better or worse if they had unlimited tracks instead of four tracks and bouncing things down or, 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 you know, whoever you want to use as an example, you know, and, and yeah, that was definitely a thing, you know, too. I mean, tracking straight to analog and, you know, a lot of times recording live off the floor, basically with, you know, maybe with the exception of over, overdubbing the vocals later or whatever, but it's like, 
you know, these bands lived on the road and they were so tight. And it was, it was definitely a different, a different standard back then. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I was reading on the press release is that you have a lot of internal dialogues. <laughs> you have, you have yeah. always like doubts when you're writing something, when you're making music, though you have those voices in your head that, you know, pasteurize you somehow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 At the risk of sounding like a crazy person. Yeah. It's, it's really true. You know, it's, you know, I'm so obsessed with, with, um, this idea of, of not having throwaway tracks and, and second rate songs in our catalog. And I've always, I've always tried my best to do that, you know, and, and obviously I'm, I'm not saying everything we've done is great and, and whatever. I would never say anything like that, but, but there's always that effort there, you know, to make sure that there's nothing, you know, man, is this, is this really good enough, you know, to, to be on a theocracy album? Is this, does this need to come out? So there's a lot of, a lot of second guessing and a lot of, um, you know, throwing things away and, and restarting ideas and, and trying to make them the best they can be. So, so yeah, it can definitely be a bit of a burden and uh, I do kind of drive myself crazy with it in a, in a, in a way that's, uh, maybe not so healthy, but, but, you know, at least, uh, I would rather have, five albums that I feel completely proud of than, than 10 albums that, you know, I feel okay about. So. Yeah. Do you think sometimes, that, you know, the role of a producer is exactly to avoid you going into like <laughs> crazy <laughs> becoming like <whoop>, some. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably who knows. I, I think, I think the guys trust me enough, you know, by now to where, to where it's it's worked out okay so far and 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 you know it, it helps really having having the other guys to bounce those things off of too because um you know i've learned to at least step back enough to to say hey am i you know am i hearing this right what do you, what do you guys think is this good should we should we work on this should we toss this and do something else you know what do you think so so it's it's really beneficial to kind of surround yourself with people you can trust yeah you know, sometimes, yeah, I understand like trying to be perfect in the in the sense of pleased with everything that you do and you hear in case of being a musician. You know, for me, I had this conversation like a couple of weeks ago about the radio show I record at home. You know, sometimes I do a first take. It's, you know, it's fine, but I'm not happy. I try a second take. I make a mistake. I record a third and then the mistakes starting to build up. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, why am I going through this? The first one. All right. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Are yeah. you, it, you have those moments as well where you realize, okay, no, the first take is actually good. You know, oh, for, for sure. Absolutely. I, I mean, especially I, I've noticed it happens when you're, when you're, when you haven't gotten enough sleep and you're tired, you know, you can really, you can really kind of go around in circles with things and, and yeah, exactly what you're talking about. You know, so many examples of, of stepping away from something and coming back the next day and, and, and thinking, you know, that one's fine. What was I driving myself crazy about? You know, that's, it's not going to get any better the more I do it. And, and, and fortunately I, I, I have always had that, um, I've never been, despite being labeled, you know, as a perfectionist and whatever people say, you know, I've always had that thing where I've never been one to, to sit and endlessly chase something and always think I can do better. I can do better. I can do better. Usually when I have it, I, I know it, you know, whether that's the first take or, or the, um, you know, no matter how long it takes. Um, so, so I know what it is I want to hear. It's just a matter of, of getting it there and, and. And yeah, sometimes, sometimes you do have to kind of step away and, and come back with fresh ears and say, yeah, I was, I was way overthinking that. Yeah. You know, because sometimes that first take really has the magic or an essence, you know, that makes it, you know, relatable somehow. And then when, yeah. you, when you, yeah, try and, to and, and that, even, you just lose it. <laughs> right, right, right. And even, even that initial spark, I mean, there were, there were, several moments on on this record where um i thought the the vocals i'd sung on the demo 
I, I couldn't get it as good on something else. So I, I would cut a line in from the, from the original demo that I did instead of, in, like you were talking about, instead of spending six hours trying to sing it the same way, it's like, why? You know, the demo was fine. It was better, you know? So, so yeah, it's just about being able to, to kind of step outside enough to know what it needs to sound like and know uh, what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And you know, on this record, you finish with a <clears throat> epic track, 19 minute long Red Sea. You wrote those, that song when you were 19, uh, mm -hmm. as far as I read. Uh, was the track already that long when you wrote initially, or it was just something when you decided to get back to it now, kind of developed it to a epic <laughs> 19 minute song? It, it was that long. You know, the, the, the old demo was, was, I think it was maybe 18 minutes, so it was right around the same length. But I, I did change a lot. I mean, there were there were parts in there. I mean, you know, the overall idea was there. Most of the music was there, but there were parts that just weren't weren't good enough. It, and so those got tossed and rewritten, and and some of it was re rearranged. Um, you know, it, one of the things that comes with experience when you're dealing with really long songs like that is 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 trying to make it sound seamless and make it sound um uh like one listening experience you know and 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 that takes time to to kind of to be able to do that you know so so a lot of that early version was sounded kind of jammed together and and you know parts that didn't really belong together and and, and abrupt transitions and things like that so so it was, a lot of it was a matter of kind of smoothing that stuff out and 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 uh redoing that as well but it was always it was always a long song and and it was the same story as as mirror of souls or any of our long songs they always end up longer than i than i originally planned i mean mirror of souls i remember that that song is 22 minutes and i remember thinking when i had the idea that it would be a great eight or ten minute song you know and and then as the story you know as you get the completion of the story and and sort of uh figure out how to 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 draw everything to a close it's you know it ends up being longer than planned in my case <laughs> <laughs> and you know i, I enjoyed the, uh, you know there was a part like with the, with the chorus almost like counterpoint melodies as well mm -hmm. something queen sabotage have yep. done brilliantly in the past um how did you come up with that because it sounded it's not very I mean, I have no experience singing or anything like that, but I'm sure it's not easy to do and to record and to, you know, to sound that good. How long did it take, you know, those special parts to be recorded normally? How many takes, you know, voice takes do you have for all that, if you remember? I don't remember specifically, but it, it depends on the... It, you know, as you mentioned, Sabotage, they were a huge influence for me, you know, back in the day. I mean, nobody's done that that type of thing better, you know, and, and so it was it was really trying to, to recreate that kind of feel. And it really just depends on the part. I mean, I mean, some of the some of those big choirs with the, the big counterpoints, you know, like in Red Sea, for example, towards the end and or even in the middle, you know, it can be it could be 80 tracks of vocals or something ridiculous, you know, where, I, and then sometimes it's more, it's a little more, uh, more streamlined than that. It just depends on if it, you know, if it's supposed to sound like a massive choir or, or just sound like, um, you know, a few different parts going at once. But, but I've always enjoyed the challenge of, of trying to, to come up with those, those sections. I, th I think we have, we have at least one on every album, I think. And, and, um, yeah, just, uh, channeling my, my inner sabotage fan from back in the day. <laughs> yeah. I love sabotage. I'm a huge fan of, you know, the band. It's just, you know, they're amazing. And, you know, I know John Oliva is working on a new sabotage album, the last one. And, um, you know, I hope that sees the light of day <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I do too. He's been he's been talking it up. It sounds like he's got some some pretty good material. So, yeah. so yeah, yeah I I hope so. 
I did an interview with him and uh, he, he was already talking about bringing Doc to record some a song or two as well. And, you know, I'm, he got me all hyped up, but, you know. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. I got excited when I read it. I think Zach, too, he said, you know, he's yeah. going to trade some vocals. So sounds great. Bring it on. <laughs> yeah. And he, normally when you do this, you know, I'm just curious, do you double the tracks or do you like to record the vocals you know, over and over again. Um, um, it, dep it depends on the part. So the, the lead vocals, I don't double. I, that's just one voice. And then um, the choirs like that, it's usually like if if I'm going to do like my biggest kind of choir um, for a grand finale or, or just one of the huge vocal parts, it'll be, I mean, I'll stack probably eight voices per part you know, per octave, you know, if I can sing it. So it'll be, you know, I'll do the main part eight times, then I'll sing it the same notes, but an octave lower, you know, eight times and the same notes, but an octave higher eight times. And then I'll move on to the first harmony and, and keep doing it like that. Cause, but the cool thing is now, um, having Taylor in the band, Taylor Washington, our, our, our new guitar player. And he's, he's also the lead singer for, for a band called Paladin. And he has, an amazing voice and it, it works really well with mine. And that's been a, a really fun thing live, um, you know, to explore too, just, just, you know, harmonizing together with him. It's very exciting, but, um, yeah. So, so, you know, this time around I did the, the, on those choir parts, I did it that way. Like I usually do. And then we did a separate section, a uh, separate session, I should say, um, where we went to the studio and brought in Taylor and Jared and, and Jonathan, you know, the other guys from the band who can all sing. And we basically did the whole, the same process again, you know, not as many tracks, but, but, you know, got around the microphone and, and sang all the parts and, and different octaves. And so, so blending, you know, the, the, that group session with the original session of just my voice, it made it sound just massive. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great process. You know, one of the songs that I enjoy was uh, The Greatest Hope. You know, I'm a sucker for ballads and <laughs> slow tempo songs. What were you going through? What was in your head when you wrote the song? But, yeah, that's that's nice of you to say. It's funny because I, I just did another interview where someone said, um, I didn't like The Greatest Hope. I thought it didn't fit on the album, but I just don't like ballads. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all right well i'll consult you next time you know yeah but, I, i'm um, a sucker for them i love yeah that's you know if... yeah I, I love a good ballad too yeah. but yeah and that one was it was um man uh, it, it was sort of a uh since the last album you know I, I lost all of my grandparents other family members passed away you know people that i loved and, and so i you know that thread kind of pops up a few times in the album and and it, it just it really came out in that song you know and um it you know it wasn't any about any one particular person it was sort of a a, a, a composite of you know different people um to kind of create the the characters in the song and and i wasn't even really planning to to write that song you know i, I went to there's a, a place near my house that's by the water that I'll sometimes go and sit when I'm, when I'm trying to write, or, um, you know, and, and, and come up with ideas and, and that's just what came out that day. So it wasn't even, you know, I didn't even, uh, necessarily plan on writing a song about, about those people or those topics, but, but, uh, I guess I needed to get it out. Yeah. Is it hard when, you know, when you lose someone and especially when you lose more than one person, you know, not to be affected by it. And when, especially near a musician, you know, I doubt that no one has, you know, that sentiment of not writing about it because being a musician is, is about emotion is about feelings. And if you try to hide those feelings, you know, doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and right right and for, and, you, and, it, for you was just like you know inevitable to just write about it i think so too and and the you know to get it out in a way that that doesn't sound like 
you know, I mean, so many songs have been written now, you know, it's like, there's, there's nothing new under the sun. So it's, it's like, man, can I do this in a way that, that, um, doesn't sound like the way that everybody else has done it, you know, and, and you have to just kind of trust that your own, your own sort of instinct and, 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 uh, style will come through and make it something, something different, you know, and, um, from, from my own perspective, you know, that's, that's, that perspective is only mine and just try to write it in a way that, that, uh, you know, gets out what I need to get out and hopefully other people can, can find something in there that they relate to as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with, uh, with everything going on on the planet, we got wars now, we have co we had COVID and, you know, winter is coming and we probably will, you know, have, you know, again, to worry about that. Um, what is the biggest challenge being in a band these days with so with everything changing so fast, what is the biggest challenge that you see that being in a band, you know, is actually an issue? I think it depends on the band. Um, I think for me, you know, and I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but, you know, coming up with a material that, that is, that needs to be released. Uh, I know that sounds kind of funny, but, but again, there's so much, there's so much out there and, and most of what, you, most of what's being released, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, if it didn't exist, the world wouldn't really be a worse place for it because it doesn't add that much value. So, so trying to come up with something that's actually authentic and meaningful and, and, and has a real purpose, you know, is, is a, that's, that's an ongoing challenge always. Um, but then more specifically for us, I think, um, in theocracy, it's the biggest challenge is honestly scheduling <laughs> because we're all so busy, you know, there are like families and side jobs and travel and, and people living in different parts of the country and everything. So, so finding the, the time and the ability to get together, you know, at the same time, um, that it's almost a full-time job just trying to schedule a, a rehearsal, you know, or, or whatever. So, so for us, that's the biggest challenge, but I'm, I'm thankful for that because that's, that means, um, we don't, you know, it could be a lot worse, you know, we could <laughs> hate, we could hate each other or have, you know, drug problems in the band or, or, or whatever, you know, I mean, so it's, as challenges go, that's a, that's a pretty, a pretty good one to have. Yeah. Right, Matt, before we go, what are the plans for Theocracy for 2024? Try to tour. Uh, are you able to think about music still <laughs> for, for new music? What are the plans? Yeah, try to try to tour in some in some regard. We're, we're discussing what exactly that is at the moment because we um well, as I was just saying, you know, scheduling can be can be so difficult, but we had um we've done whatever probably six European tours now and plus all the one-off shows and festivals and here in the States we've only played more sporadically I mean, we've played a lot of shows but it's been all spread out and kind of random so so right now we're talking about you know what we want to do for next year if we want to concentrate on the U.S. first or or, or um, you know we've already got offers from from Europe so do we want to go over there again first so so hopefully some sort of touring situation. I'm just not sure exactly what that's going to be, you know, just yet. Yeah. And music wise, you're not thinking about music. I mean, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, with the, with the new lineup with, with Taylor and, and Ernie on board, Ernie's been our, Ernie Tober, and he's been our drummer since, since right after the last album, Ghost Ship, he's played all the shows, you know, for that record, but this was the first album he actually recorded. So, um, having both those guys on board, how kind of has me excited, you know? So I, I think it's going to be, it's going to be fun to write and I'm, lo I'm looking forward to writing with Taylor. And so I hope that I think, um, you know, I always say I, I can't, I've learned not to try to predict the future, but I, I think hopefully the, the wait for new music will be not as long this next time. So, so, um, yeah, nothing, nothing concrete yet, but I'd like to start thinking about it sooner than later.
Cool. All right, Matt, thank you very much for your time. All the best. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys in Europe next year. All right. I hope so. I All hope right. so. Thank, thank you for thank speaking you. to me. Thank you. Hope to Take see care. you soon. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.